Chapter 26, August 1914, of Neutrality and Just Causes. In the last week of an epoch that was rushing towards oblivion, the warmongers, the warmongers in London, Paris, and St. Petersburg forced the pace with unrelenting determination. Localized Austrian retribution on Serbia had deliberately been transformed by the secret elite into an altogether greater cause for carnage. Diplomacy had been made to fail. Dishonest men can now throw up their hands in horror and cry, inevitable war. Democracy was contemptuously abused by hidden forces that had the political and financial power to manipulate public opinion. Propaganda misrepresented motive, molding fear into hysteria and empowering the madness that swept reason aside. The great plan for war against Germany that would establish the primacy of the British Empire was almost complete. The last requirement was the just cause to win over and inspire the British people. On Saturday, August 1st, Isvolsky sent a telegram from Paris to St. Petersburg saying, The French minister war the French war minister informed me in hearty high spirits that the government had firmly decided on war and begged me to endorse the hope of the French general staff and all efforts will be directed against Germany. France had firmly decided on war almost 24 hours before Germany had announced mobilization or declared war on Russia. General Joffrey was straining at the leash he sent Poincaré a personal ultimatum that he would no longer accept responsibility for the command of the French army unless a general mobilization was ordered. Poincaré did not need much encouragement. At 4 p.m. that day, telegrams, ordered, telegrams ordering the French general mobilization were sent from the Central Telegraph office in Paris. By that point, Serbia, Austria, Russia, France and Great Britain had begun military measures of one sort or another. Germany alone among the powers concerned had none yet done so. That afternoon the German leaders gathered at the Kaiser's palace in Berlin. Bethmann and von Chigau arrived with sensational news from Lichnowsky in London. The British government had just given a promise that France would remain neutral under a British guarantee. Hugely relieved, the Kaiser called for champagne. He sent a telegram to King George. If Britain guarantees the neutrality of France, I will abandon all action against her. End quote. The King summoned Grey in to Buckingham Palace that Saturday evening to help frame a response. King George replied, I think there must be some misunderstanding of a suggestion that passed in friendly conversation between Prince Lichnowsky and Sir Edward Grey. There was no British guarantee of French neutrality. It had simply been another delaying tactic to ruse, a ruse to gain whatever advantage. At 5 p.m., after waiting in vain for 24 hours for an answer to his telegram demanding that the Russians stop all military movements on his borders, the Kaiser ordered general mobilization. Germany was the last of the continental powers to take that irrevocable step. How does that possibly fit with the claim that Germany started the First World War? An hour later, in St. Petersburg, Portales, the German ambassador, went to Sazonov and asked him three times if the Russian government would halt the mobilization. In the full knowledge, that it meant the European war, Sazonov replied that it would continue. Count Portales handed him Germany's declaration of war and burst into tears. Time, 6 p.m., August 1st. Germany's declaration was an understandable reaction, but a tactical mistake. Russia had been mobilizing with the definite intent of it of attacking Germany, but Sazonov had been instructed that he should not make an actual declaration of war. The vital message oft repeated by Gray to Poincare and Sazonov was that France and Russia must, 
as far as possible conceal the military preparations and intent on war until Germany had swallowed the bait. The British people would never support the aggressor in a European war, and it was imperative that Germany should be made to appear the aggressor. It was akin to bullies golden, threatening and ganging up on a single boy in the school playground, but the moment he had the audacity to defend himself, he was to blame. What else could Germany have done? She was provoked into a struggle for life or death. It was a stark choice, await certain destruction or strike out to defend herself. Kaiser Wilhelm had exposed his country to grave danger and almost lost the one precious advantage Germany had by delaying countermeasures to the Russian mobilization in the forlorn hope of peace. The German army depended entirely upon light, light, lightning success at the very start of a war on two fronts. Germany's only effective defense was through offense. On the 1st of August, the London Daily News declared, The greatest calamity in history is upon us. At this moment, our fate is being sealed by hands that we know not, by motive aliens to our interests, by motives alien to our interests, by influences that if we knew, we should certainly repudiate. The Daily News had summed up the situation perfectly. The British people knew nothing of the hands that were sealing their fate. They would never have gone to war in support of Russia. Indeed, in a war between Russia and Germany, there was every chance that the man in the street would support Germany. Public opinion was not clamoring for war. Every liberal, radical, and socialist paper, paper in the kingdom stood against participation in the European conflict. Nor was there any obvious sign of rabid jingoism yet. The secret elite knew precisely what would move public opinion. Belgium, if Britain's excuse for entering the war was focused well away from Russia, then Gray's final requirement would fall into place and the lock would be sprung. The people would clamor for war. If the cause became the defense of gallant little Belgium against the contemptible German invasion. It was Belgian neutrality that would furnish him with the best excuse for entering the war. Gray turned Belgian neutrality into a cause celebre. celebre. He told the German ambassador, Prince Lynchnowski, that it would be extremely difficult to restrain public feeling in Britain if Germany violated Belgian neutrality. Lynchnowski asked whether Gray would could give me a definite declaration of the neutrality of Great Britain on the condition that we, we as in Germany, respected Belgium's neutrality. It was an astonishing suggestion, an enormous concession, and one that could have spared Britain and Belgium the horrors of war. Lynchnowski was prepared to concede exactly what Great claimed the British cabinet wanted, Belgium's sovereignty would be respected in exchange for a promise of Britain's neutrality. Duplicitous as ever, Gray blurred the issue and avoided an honest reply, reassuring Lynchnowski that for the present there was not the slightest intention of proceeding to hostilities against Germany. When the Kaiser read the diplomatic note from his ambassador, he wrote in the margin, my impression is that Mr. Gray is a false dog who is afraid of his own meanness and false policy, but who will not come out into the open against us, preferring to let himself be forced by us to do it. Right again. Wilhelm, though Gray still had two objectives, to gain as much time as possible for Russia and to turn the public in favor of war. Astonishingly, Lynchnowski's proposal on neutrality was never revealed to the cabinet or House of Commons. Had it been, a significant majority would likely have agreed to it. Gray's deception might never have come to light had Chancellor Bethman not exposed this offer in the Reichstag on the 4th of August. Offer in the Reichstag on 
4th of August. We have informed the British government that, along, that as long as Great Britain remains neutral, our fleet will not attack the northern coast of France, and that we will not violate the territorial integrity and independence of Belgium. These assurances I now repeat before the world. Gray ensured that every offer of peace and neutrality from Berlin was rejected or suppressed, while at the same time his cabinet colleagues were informed that he was outraged by the way in which Germany had put aside all attempts at accommodation while marching steadily to war. Inside Asquith's cabinet, Charles Hobhouse saw a marked change in the foreign secretary at this time. Hobhouse wrote in his diary that from the moment it became clear that Germany would violate Belgian neutrality, Gray, who was sincerity itself, became violently pro-French and eventually the author of our rupture with Germany. Gray became violently pro-French. How little Hobhouse and most of his cabinet colleagues knew of the real Gray, knew of his years of secret planning for war on Germany, knew of the agreements he had put in place with France. Their ignorance was, to an extent, understandable. On four separate occasions over the previous two years, Gray and Asquith stood at the dispatch box in the House of Commons and solemnly assured Parliament that Britain was entirely free from any secret obligations to any, Europe, to any other European country. In a private letter to his ambassadors, in Paris, Gray noted, there would be a row of, in Parliament here if I had used words which implied the possibility of a secret engagement unknown to the Parliament all these years committing us to a European war. Hobhouse was not witnessing a sudden change in Gray's attitude, but in unmasking. The revelation of his real commitment to a cause that could not be named, the secret elite's war to destroy Germany, Hobhouse saw Gray in a new light as the author of our rupture with Germany. He did belatingly realize that Sir Edward Gray bore heavy responsibility for the world First World War. Did he belatedly realize that Sir Edward Gray bore heavy responsibility for the First World War? Clearly, Gray was poisoning the cabinet atmosphere with pro-French, anti-German rhetoric. Crucially, he now placed Belgium at the center of this heated discussion. The issue was suddenly about loyalty to Belgium and about Britain standing as a great power, which would be damaged forever if she stood beside while Belgium was being crushed. He diverted the arguments away from Russian mobilization, misrepresented the Kaiser's intention, and made no mention of Serbia. He cited the treaty dated, dating from 1839, falsely claiming that it obliged Britain to take up arms in defense of Belgium. Asquith and Churchill agreed, but Gray met strong resistance from the majority of the cabinet. He later claimed that the question of Belgium neutrality emerged for the first time at the end of, the, of July 1914, long after the war ended, when the secret elite had to to mask and carefully reinterpret their pre-war actions, he wrote that Chancellor Bethman's very mention of Belgium on the 29th of July lit up an aspect that had not been looked at, as if it had suddenly dawned on him and the Foreign Office that Belgium would play a strategic part in a continental war. It was an outrageous lie, and one that has been perpetuated ever since. Sir Hugh Strachan, professor of the history of war and a fellow of all souls at Oxford University gave a different interpretation. But Belgium was not decided that the invader, but Belgium was not decided that the invader would be German. Right up until the war's outbreak, it continued to espouse a policy of pure neutrality, treating all its neighbors as potential enemies, end quote. That is profoundly untrue. Belgium was in cahoots with the Entente countries, most specifically Britain. Belgium was not some unknown and forgotten corner of Europe that history bypassed on a regular basis. It had long been a battlefield in continental wars and sat in a neutral basin between the Jura Mountains and the English Channel. 
Belgium was not the north way gateway. Belgium was not the northern gateway to Paris or indeed Berlin. Confidential Belgian documents, to which we made detailed references in Chapter 6, completely refuted Gray's nonsense and proved that top secret military agreements between Britain and Belgium had been in place since 1906, when the Committee of Imperial Defense and the War Office began the process of modernizing the British Army. This accord included comprehensive arrangements for military cooperation and elaborate plans for the landing of British troops who were scheduled to disembark at Dun Dunkirk and Calais in such numbers that half of the British army could be transported to Belgium within eight days of mobilization. The British supply the British supply base was to be moved from the French coast to Antwerp in Belgium as soon as the North Sea had been cleared of German warships. Lieutenant Colonel Bernardston, the British military attaché to Brussels, had emphasized to the chief of the Belgian general staff, Major General de Carme, that these arrangements had to be kept absolutely confidential and known only to his minister and the British general staff. In 1912, when the likelihood of a European war over the Balkans became a serious possibility, our Anglo-Belgian military arrangements had been further refined. Secret guidebooks for the British military dated that year contained highly detailed maps of Belgian towns, villages, and rural, rural areas including railway stations, church depots suitable for observation posts, oil depots, roads, canals, and bridges. British-Belgian military tactics had been worked out in fine detail, including the role of intermediary officers, interpreters, English translations of Belgian regulation, hospital accommodations for the British wounded, and more. Bernardston's successor as British military attached Attaché to Brussels, Lieutenant Colonel Bridges confirmed to the Belgians that Britain had an army composed of six divisions of infantry and eight brigades of cavalry, 160,000 men in all, and that everything was ready to go. Remarkably, the minutes of the meeting between Colonel Bridges and the Belgian Chief of Staff in 1912, General Jungsbluff, stated that the British would have landed her troops in Belgium in all circumstances, with or without Belgian consent, if Germany attacked France. Where would that have placed where would that have placed the sanctity of Belgian neutrality? On February of nineteen fourteen, the rate of exchange for payment of British soldiers fighting the in Belgium had been fixed. That was some six months ahead of the conflict. Britain and Belgium had been deeply involved in joint military preparations against Germany for at least eight years. Bethmann's honorable proposal on the 29th of July regarding the integrity of Belgium brought no sudden and unexpected enlightenment as Sir Edward Grey would have us believe. It brought him a tangible excuse. He had, from that moment on, diplomatic proof of Germany's ill intentions. On the 1st of August, Gray telegraphed Brussels urging the Belgian leaders to maintain their absolute neutrality. It was essential that Belgium kept up the charade of neutrality until the very last in order to provide Gray with the trump card, with his trump card. Belgian neutrality was a sham. Gray knew perfectly well that she would side with Britain, France, and Russia against Germany. It had long been so arranged. Northcliffe's newspaper would ensure that the public outrage turned against Germany with a truly spiteful venom, and the secret elite could start their war. Sir Edward Grey was fully aware that Belgium had actually been mobilizing her armed forces for almost a week under the guise of self-protection against anyone who might try to cross the Belgian border. To this effect, a mobilization order had been issued by the Belgium government on the 24th of July, and on the 28th of July, three classes of army reserves were called up. 
the Belgians, were as ready as they could be to repulse the German invader. It was no coincidence that this neutral little country began, began military preparations against Germany on the very same day that both Russia and France began theirs. The secret elite elevated the independence of sovereignty of Belgium to a higher level of moral obligation, just as they had with Serbia's dignity and sovereignty. Such altruistic and chivalrous sentiments suited their public stance, while behind the scenes they manipulated, dictated to, interfered with, and essentially controlled these little independent countries. It was no little it was no different from the manipulation of Russia which they exerted through their puppets is Volsky and Sazanov, and France through Poincare. The hypocrisy of Gray and the secret elite knew no bounds. They were fully aware that Germany would, by necessity, have to cross Belgium in its defense against France. Such temporary use of a right of way was very different from a permanent and wrongful invasion. There, was, there, were, there were precedents during the Boer War, British troops were permitted passage across neutral Portuguese territory to fight in southern Africa, in South Africa. The scale of the British hypocrisy over Belgium was indeed breathtaking. The armed forces of British imperialism had been trampling uninvited over countries across the world for centuries. Such British action was, of course, always regarded as a self-evident right as a self-evident right. Gray's imperious stance was given backbone by his foreign office mentor, Sir Ernst Kroll, who provided him with answers to all the objections voiced in cabinet in a secret and detailed memo. Sir Erie Crow, Sir Erie Crow's commitment to the secret elite cause was so absolute that he carried the conviction of the infallible zealot. He rejected the arguments that Britain should not engage in a European war by pointing out that useless that unless they were used the maintenance of an all-powerful navy and dedicated ex expeditionary force was nothing less than an abuse of resources forced on the country at enormous and wasteful expense. Crow dismissed the signs of commercial panic in the city and in stock markets across Europe as part of Germany's well-laid plans for war. He accused German financial houses of being notoriously in daily contact with the German embassy and plotting the downfall of the British Empire. This was somewhat precious given the close links between the British government and the House of Rothschild, Barings, and Lazards. Neutrality he dismissed as a dishonorable act. The Entente was praised as a moral bond. Erie Crow rep repudiated the claim that England cannot in any circumstance go to war by stating that any other action would be political suicide. His parting shot was a his parting shot was a rally call to arms. I feel confident that our duty and our interest will be seen to lie in standing by France in her hour of need. France has not sought the quarrel it has been forced upon her. These were the values of the British cabinet. These were the values that the British cabinet was asked to accept. A litany of lies that were repeated so often they became accepted as fact. Could the secret elite could the secret elite placement convince the cabinet that Britain had no option but war? Asked with confessed in a letter to his beloved Venetia that he had a problem. The cabinet was not merely split on the question of going to war. It was massively against such an epoch-changing step. No one should underestimate the enormity of the challenge that Gray and Asquith faced, even though Northcliffe and the Times and all of the powerful agencies that operated behind the political screen backed them to, a hilt, to the hilt. This was a cabinet that had no intention of going to war or of approving a war cabinet that represented a political party that would never vote for war and a population that had no concept of the war that was planned for them. If ever a disparate group required careful man management, it was asked with liberal cabinet how he, 
Gray, Haldane, Churchill, and Lloyd George achieved the secret elite's objective remains a testament to how good men can be worn down by expectation, pressure, false information, and inflamed public reaction to turn their back on what they know to be right. Asquith convened a special cabinet meeting on this on Sunday, August 2, 1914, had a vote on Britain's involvement in a European war been taken at the outset, only to known stalwarts would have been in favor. The other campaign-hardened political veterans were set against it. Lord Morley complained they, that they had known nothing of the extent of the military and naval agreements with the French. They began to appreciate that a web of obligations, which, ha- which they had been a- assured were not obligations, had been spun round them while they slept. But realization dawned slowly, and Asquith was sufficiently astute to avoid rushing to a decision by a show of hands. Those anxious, heavy-hearted, loyal liberals, whose consciences, whose conscience and years of commitment to peace made the meeting almost unbearable, struggled with the enormity that was suddenly presented to them. Sir Edward Grey kept secret the German proposal on neutrality. It was never voiced as an option. Had cabinet ministers been given all relevant information and time to consider the options, discuss the implications with significant others in their constituencies, and prepare themselves properly, matters would likely have taken a very different turn. Instead, they had to listen to situation reports from Berlin, Paris, and St. Petersburg, Vienna, and Belgium that caught them by surprise and were presented in a manner that vilified Germany. Talk of resignations, three perhaps, four, darkened the mood and threatened to tear the cabinet apart. Asquith faced the prospect of having to form a coalition government with the conservative and union op- opposition. It had no appeal, but if needs dictated, but if needs dictated, Asquith knew he could count on them to go to war. He had in his pocket a letter from the conservative leader, leaders Bonar Law, Lord Lansdowne, and Austin Chamberlain that promised unhesitating support for the government in any measures that were required to assist to assist Russia and France in their war against Germany. Their view was that it would be fatal to honor it would be fatal to the honor and security of the United Kingdom to hesitate in supporting France and Russia at the present juncture. It was a letter that had been written at the suggestion of Balfour in, in the inner circle of the secret elite. Just as Sazanov was provided with reassurance by the secret elite agents, so Asquith, Asquith and Gray were assured that they were not alone. Asquith begged cabinet members John Burns, Sir John Simmons, Lord Buchamp, Joseph Pease, and others who were clearly swithering not to make a rash decision. He implored them to wait at least until Sir Edward Grey had addressed Parliament. The semblance of a united cabinet, however illusory, would have a greater impact on the general public than a clear division of opinions and would avoid the identification of figureheads around whom opponents of the war might rally. The secret elite would not entertain any unwelcome diversions as they took the final decisive step to push Britain into the war. The non-interventionists, those who did not want any involvement at all, were not themselves united. Some would accept war if Belgium was violated. The pros and cons of neutrality were thrashed around the cabinet table. Eventually, a loose consensus agreed that Sir Edward Grey would tell the House of Commons that Britain could not stand aside if Belgium was invaded, that France France would be given maritime support, and Germany would be advised of this. The opening cabinet session lasted for three hours, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., at which point Asquith scribbled a note to Venetia, we are on the brink of a split. The Prime Minister was renowned for his excessive drinking, but he was no dupe. He, above all, knew the enormous hurdle faced in turning the cabinet round to accept war. 
not least because he was certain that a good three quarters of his own party stood for absolute non-interference at any price. He did everything possible to avoid putting a decision to the vote, and his tactic worked. Churchill was by far the most eager for war. Asquith wrote, Winston very bellicose and demanding immediate mobilization. The cabinet had refused to give him permission to proceed with the mobilization of the fleet, but Churchill sent the order anyway. Sir Edward Grey was not to be outdone. At 3 p.m. on that Saturday, Sunday afternoon during an interval between the two cabinet meetings, he called the French ambassador, Paul Cambone, and confirmed that if Germany warships came into the channel to attack France, the British Navy would sink them. This should have been subject to parliamentary approval, though in the event Parliament was never asked. Cambone was careful to hide his elation. If Britain was prepared to take sides to protect the Channel coast, she was halfway to a full commitment to war. He would later comment, the game was won. A great country does not make war by halves. By halves. Cambone knew it, and Sir Edward Grey knew it. Britain was going to war. And what of David Lloyd George, the erstwhile pacifist and dazzling devious darling of the radical masses in whom the hope and trust of the anti-war liberals had been invested? Lloyd George appeared to be on the side of the non-interventionists and should have been their natural leader. They assumed that he was, but were very mistaken. Lloyd George had long since sold his soul to the secret elite. Had he been allowed to remain a free agent, an anti-war liberal group headed by him would have represented the secret elite's gravest nightmare. The damage he would have caused was literally boundless. A splinter cabinet led by a national figure, a rallying point for the liberals and the Labour Party in Parliament would have spelled disaster for the warmongers. But Lloyd George was not what he seemed. It was not for his own sake that he had been saved by the secret elite from public scandal, extramarital access, from court cases, and from opprobrium of the Marconi scandal, been favored with a wealthy lifestyle and mistress and kept in a luxury he could never have personally afforded. Lloyd George simply continued his long-term payback. The cabinet met again that evening. Gray informed them that he had told Cambone of their agreement to protect France if the German Navy attacked their channel coastline. Nothing further was decided. No one appeared to realize what Cambone instantly surmised. Britain had taken sides. The Liberal cabinet tottered on the brink of disintegration. Ten or eleven ministers were still against war. Not undecided, still against the war. Surely the essential qualities of British fairness, decency, and parliamentary democracy would safeguard the nation from a disaster that its elected representatives did not want. A number of the less prominent cabinet members looked to Lloyd George for leadership at that moment but found none. Lord Morley felt, with hindsight, that the cabinet would have collapsed that night if Lord George had given lead to the waverers. The waverers and Hancourt appealed to the Chancellor to speak, for, to speak for us. To no avail, Lloyd George led the opponents of war into a cul-de-sac and left them there. In Brussels, that August evening, German ambassador handed over the sealed letter that Molteki had earlier forwarded into his safekeeping. It stated that Germany had reliable information that France intended to attack her through Belgium and she would therefore be forced to enter Belgium in response. If Belgium did nothing to halt this invasion, Germany promised that once the war was over and peace resumed, she would evacuate the territory, make good any damage done, and pay for food used by her troops. However, if the movement of German troops was opposed, Germany regretted that she would have to regard Belgium as an enemy. The Belgians were given 12 hours to reply, that is, by 7 a.m. on August 3rd. King Alfred of Belgium sent a message to Sir Edward Grey to confirm that Belgium would refuse the German request and appealed for British support. The 
telegram was timed to perfection for Gray's vital speech in the House of Commons later that day. It provided ammunition to sway the cabinet and parliament. How could anyone of moral standing reject gallant little Belgium's desperate plea for help? In London, in the small hours of Monday, August 3rd, with his cabinet abed and blissfully ignorant of his intentions, Ask with quietly advanced all preparations for war. He wrote out the author authorization for mobilization of the British Army. Lord Haldane personally delivered it to the War Office at 11 o'clock that morning and issued the very orders that he had prepared years before when he held the office of Minister for War. The first steps had already started five days earlier, but the instructions had to be made official. The secret elite had, though through its agents, authorized the general mobilization of both the British Navy and Army without the approval of the Cabinet or Parliament. Later that warm bank holiday morning, ministers returned yet again to Downing Street just before Cabinet. Asquith met privately with the conservative leaders, Law and Lord Lansdowne. He advised them that if a critical number of liberal ministers resigned, a coalition government would be the only way forward. He knew he could rely on their support for war since the conservative leaders were fellow agents of the secret elite. In cabinet, Asquith announced the resignations of John Byrne and Lord Morley and the junior minister Charles Trevelyan. Trevelyan. He asked if he he should go to the king to offer his resignation or if coalition government might be the answer. It was essentially blackmail. He knew that the waverers were extremely reluctant to bring down the liberal government at this crucial juncture in Britain, Britain's history. No further offers of resignation were tendered. The cabinet broke up in some disarray. No vote had been taken on the critical issue of Britain going to war. It was such a clever ploy. By continually seeking a consensus, Asquith wore down his cabinet critics and created the illusion of debate. Later, much later, another prime minister would substitute the myth of weapons of mass destruction for a myth of Belgrade's, Belgians' neutrality. Inside Parliament, Sir Edward Grey had far more support from the opposition benches than from his own party. Balfour, Bonarlaw, F. E. Smith, and Carson had been advised in advance of the likelihood of war and promised unreserved support. In the House of Lords, many powerful men stood ready to ensure that every sinew was strained to approve war. Lords Derby, Lansdowne, Rothschild, Corzon, and Milner the beating heart of the secret elite, were joined by the press baron Lord Northcliffe and the financial, industrial, and commercial interests that bore no single name. Gray would be the focus of attention in Parliament, but at no stage was he acting alone. As members of Parliament gathered in the House of Commons at 3 p.m. that day, bursting with expectations and apprehensions, Many would have read the Times' full-blooded call to arms against Germany. The blame was fall mainly on Germany, was its rant. How ridiculously ironic that the editorial written by Geoffrey Dawson complained of Germany mobilizing behind the mask of conversations. When the very opposite was the case, the villains who had mobilized behind such a mask were Russia, France, and Britain. Accusations of a German invasion of France, a German resolve to crush France, a forthcoming German invasion of Holland and Belgium were followed in that editorial by an appeal to duty, both in Britain and in the Empire. When Britain goes to war, the whole empire is at war. End quote. It was one day ahead of itself. The Times was the voice of the secret elite and well informed in all aspects of its business. It carried a detailed insider report on the arduous Sunday cabinet meetings and talked disparagingly, disparagingly of the few cabinet descendants who did not want intervention. Mr. Asquith was cheerfully advised that it would be no disadvantage to bring some new blood into his administration. 
To claim that the times was one step ahead was not an empty boast. Germany, for example, did not declare war on France until 6.15 p.m. that very day. It was but a taste of the lies and propagandas that would necessarily follow. Summary, Chapter 26, August 1914, of Neutrality and Just Causes. As the great powers in Europe hurled themselves towards a continental war, the secret elite required a just cause for British involvement. The German Chancellor, Bethmann, handed the perfect excuse to Sir Edward Grey through promises about the future status of Belgium as a bargaining pawn for British neutrality. Grey's pretense in his memoirs that the issue of Belgium was an aspect that had not been previously considered was an outrageous lie. The secret elite had known that Belgium and northern France would be the prime locations for the British forces since discussions first got underway with France in 1905. It was vital to Gray's plan that Belgium remained outwardly neutral, even though the secret arrangements meant that Belgium's neutrality was a deception. Primed and supported by Sir Erie Crow and Sir Arthur Nicholson in the Foreign Office, Gray planned his assault on an unsuspecting cabinet to stop them from voting against British involvement in the coming war. Gaining their support proved a daunting task. He and Asquith secretly liased, secretly liaised with and advised secret elite politicians in the conservative and unionist parties to bring them on board and guarantee a parliamentary majority in support of war. Cabinet members were subjected to immense moral pressure on the issue of Belgium's future, especially from Gray, Haldane, and Churchill. Asquith posed as an impartial chair, but let it be known that he too would resign with Gray if the cabinet went against the foreign secretary. Lord George would have been a formidable leader, of the non-interventionists had he decided to oppose the war, but in fact his actions misled his cabinet colleagues. Cabinet opponents to the war were in a majority, but were either neutralized, Lloyd George, or browbeaten into accepting that the best option for the country was to wait until Gray had spoken in Parliament on August 3rd before resignations took place. Unbeknownst to the cabinet, and without permission, Churchill mobilized the fleet and Asquith sent Haldane to the war office to mobilize the army. Gray contacted Paul Cambone, the French ambassador, to confirm that Britain would defend the French coast from any attack by the German fleet, thus ending any semblance of British neutrality.